Get Up Nation. My name is Ben Biddick. I am the creator and host of the Get Up Nation podcast, where I serve individuals, organizations, and societies to develop and sustain resilience and perseverance. I'm the co-author of Get Up, The Art of Perseverance, with former Major League Baseball player and CEO of Ruron Living, Adam Greenberg. The Get Up Nation podcast is brought to you in partnership with GotYour6Coffee.com, where Navy veteran Eric Hadley is committed to serving first responders, veterans, and their families through a variety of nonprofit organizations. No stranger to adversity, Eric has fused necessity of coffee with his passion for public service. You're already purchasing coffee. Why not empower your coffee with purpose? Why not purchase coffee that not only has your six, but also has the backs of those who don a uniform of service for our communities and great country? Learn more about about Eric and his freshly roasted award-winning coffee at gotyoursixcoffee.com. Welcome to this episode of the Get Up Nation podcast. Recently, I had the honor and privilege of speaking with Dr. Vanita Simpson, the first female African-American neurosurgeon to complete the neurosurgery residency at Baylor College of Medicine. She received her Bachelor of Science from Florida State in 2004, her Doctor of Medicine from Georgetown University in 2011, Baylor's College of Medicine residency from 2011 to 2018, and her Enfolded Complex Spine Fellowship from 2018 to 2019. Dr. Simpson is one of the few female African African-American neurosurgeons in the world. The Baylor Neurosurgery Program is in the top 10 for the National Institute of Health research funding, and the program is affiliated with MD Anderson Cancer Center, which also happens to be the number one cancer center in the nation. Not only has Dr. Simpson achieved an elite status in the world of medicine, she has also served in the Navy since 2006, where her current rank is Lieutenant Commander. Dr. Simpson, an honor to speak with you today, and welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. First, let me congratulate you on your amazing accomplishments, and thank you also for serving this country in the Navy. Oh, you're quite welcome. I am currently active duty now at National Naval Medical Center in Portsmouth, Virginia. Amazing. I know your time is of the essence, so I'd like to jump right in here. Will you share with us your experiences that you had in childhood, which created this dream within you of being a doctor one day? I always wanted to be a doctor since I had surgery as a child. I had an umbilical hernia repaired, and I was just, like, so fascinated with all the gadgets and lights in the hospital. And that is really what stirred up my interest in medicine since I was seven years old. I always knew that I was going to be a doctor. I just didn't know what type of doctor I was going to become. I see. So... My understanding is that you witnessed deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's disease and movement disorders, and that really gripped you or engaged you in thinking about neurosurgery. Will you share what led you to wanting to pursue neurosurgery? Well, that was during my, I think it was my second or third year in medical school at Georgetown, and one of our attendings, he was actually a Baylor graduate too, Dr. Chris Calhoun. He came to speak to us about Parkinson's disease and movement disorders such as hemibolismus, which is a movement disorder of a part of your brain that causes driving movements. And I saw a video of this young man. He was like 22 years old and he had hemibolismus. And with this disease, you literally can't stop moving your arms or your body. So imagine, you know, living your life you know, just looking like you're having a seizure at all times, but you're completely coherent. And, you know, he had the surgery done, the deep brain stimulation, and then they showed the part where they turn on the generator because they turn on the generator two weeks after they place the leads into the brain, and then all of his movement just stopped, and you see this big smile come across his face. He got a job. He got a girlfriend. He was working at Walmart. And it was like, it completely changed. And I was like, oh, I'm doing this. Like, literally changing people's lives. And so that's really what turned my head to even look at neurosurgery. I'm like, what is this about? Because I initially wanted to do orthopedic surgery. And because my background was in athletic training for, like, my football team in college. So I always thought I was going to be an orthopedic surgeon, and then I hated it when I got into it. I only liked the spine part, but then when deep brain stimulation turned my head to even look at neurosurgery, I found that I liked every aspect of neurosurgery. There's so many different subspecialties. You have brain tumors, you have aneurysms, you have pediatrics, you have spine, which is my main focus. So it's just so many different areas of neurosurgery. 
breed that I gravitated towards, and I liked everything about it, not just the spine. Hmm. And to achieve what you have, you must have developed and sustained powerful personal resilience and perseverance. Whenever people have dreams and destinations that are reaching a summit as high as you have, there had to be some people or organizations or situations along the way that tried to impede or discourage you. Will you share some of your experiences, without naming any names, where people or circumstances challenged you and tried to derail you away from your dreams? Well, yeah, so at every checkpoint <laughs> in <laughs> I have, there was a, a derailment, so I, I definitely didn't go from A to B to C to D and got here. I had a lot of failures along the way and people, you know, telling me no, even going to undergrad, you know, I don't come from, you know, a wealthy family, so I really depended on scholarships. I had a 4.0 in high school. I was, you know, very academically accomplished. And I applied for some scholarships in high school for pre-med students. And my advisor didn't give it to me. And she knew I needed it. And she told me to be realistic. And she gave it to this Indian guy. He, he became a doctor, too. And, you know, well, he's more likely to, you know, go to med school. So I'm going to recommend him instead. I'm like, wow, really? I need that. Like, you can't Wow. And then in undergrad, my academic advisor, she told me to do nursing. But I don't want to do nursing. I like, I know I, my grades had slipped at the beginning because I was working so many jobs to try and help pay for tuition. So at the end of undergrad, my GPA wasn't that outstanding. And so she was like, no, I don't think medical school would be for you. I'm like, oh, okay, you're on the list too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I see. And then, even so, I studied part for the MCAT. It didn't go that well for me. I just really didn't know how to take tests. And so, I ended up doing this post back program at Georgetown, and it was geared towards underrepresented minorities in medicine, and it literally changed my life. And it taught me how to be a better student, how to be a critical thinker, and that's how I ended up at Georgetown. And then I ended up matriculating into the medical school. Hmm. But I had a lot of a nose on, on the way. Yeah. Wow. And what is your approach to embodying that resilience? So when someone challenges you or tells you that you can't do something or intentionally tries to make things difficult for you, how do you respond to that? Do you have a process you go through to successfully deal with these challenging people? How do you handle that? Well, I'm a very spiritual and religious person. Like, my mom prays for me a lot. I'm going to be honest. <laughs> 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 I, I have a village really that I have to thank for me being able to get to where I am. I have sisters and aunts and uncles and my mom and my dad, you know, and my grandma. Like, everybody played a major role into making sure that I had what I needed to succeed. So I think a lot of me getting told no was me still having faith. Because I knew what God called me to do. I, I had no question about what I was supposed to do. I didn't know it was going to be neurosurgery, but I knew I was supposed to be a doctor. And then when, you know, I initially didn't get neurosurgery, you know, I, I, I sought out other mentors to, you know, tell me, like, you know, what did I do wrong? What could I do to make the, myself a better candidate? And I've always sought out mentors that can help me along the way. And I think those people keeping the little bug in my ear has really helped me. Like, still, I have the same mentors that, you know, helped me when I was in medical school. Hmm. I see. With all that you've been through during the process of achieving what you've done, as you look back and reflect on your life and your experiences, what message do you have for school-aged children who are dreaming of what they want to be when they grow up? Well, I would say dream big and don't let anybody ever tell you no. What God has for you is for you. And, you know, if you can, like, see it, I mean, there's nothing that you can't do. I mean, plenty of people told me no 
plenty of people told me that this wasn't realistic. But I knew what I wanted to do, and I just had to keep pressing forward. You just can't listen to the haters. They're, good. They're always going to be haters. They're always going to be naysayers. You just have to block them out. And then you have to focus on your own inner power, and then you have to let your village help you. Because i got to admit, my village definitely helped me when those times where I even questioned myself, my village backed me up. Hmm. Amazing. All right. Doctor, I always end the show with six questions to help my listeners understand the why within my phenomenal guests. Will you run through these six quick questions with me? Sure. Who are you thankful for today? Today, as in August 8th? Yep. (laughs) Who am I thankful for today? I'm thankful for my mom. (laughs) All right. Thankful for my mom. My mom prayed for me today. I'm thankful for my mom today. And now that we, is she awesome? And now that we've covered who you're thankful for, what are you thankful for today? I am thankful and grateful for the opportunity to practice medicine and practice neurosurgery. I was going over some cases, and you know, it still baffles me. Like, wow, I get to do this. This is so awesome. And sometimes I surprise myself, like. I can't believe I'm doing this. This is so, I am going to get paid to do this. This is the most awesome job ever. <laughs> and a lot of people, you know, ask, well, is it worth it? Is it worth all of the time that you have to put forward into neurosurgery? Because, you know, it's seven to eight years, sometimes nine if you want to do, or it's, it's nine if you do the vascular surgery fellowship that's an additional two years. So it's, it's a lot of sacrifices that you have to make, and sometimes you'll find a lot of disgruntled doctors, like, you know, tell medical students it's not worth it, you know, if you could do something else, do anything else, and a lot of people aren't happy with their job, but I, I have the most awesome job in the world. I mean, I think of a better thing to do is blame me the saying where it says if you do something you love you'll never work a day in your life mm, I love that how do you fuel the fire within you I, I think that my patients keep me going I love when you know I get emails from the, I, and I've gotten a lot of emails from patients that I've operated on in the past during my residency and fellowship and the patients really motivate me just seeing them improve seeing people get cured of their brain tumor, seeing people be able to go back to work after a spine surgery, and seeing people being able to go back to doing the things they love, like gardening, picking up their kids, playing with their grandkids, things that they couldn't do because of debilitating pain from the spine. Wow. And what is one thing adversity taught you to value? One thing adversity taught me to value I would say the power of prayer and the power of using all of your resources. A lot of people won't ask for help, and it's right around you. So I have come across a few people during my time that helped me on the way. The program director at Columbia comes to mind. I think that, you know, through adversity, I learned how to humble myself <laughs> and definitely ask for help. Awesome. Two more questions. What are you doing today you never thought you could? I moved to a whole other side of the country by myself again and I'm making that work and I didn't think I could be happy doing that but I am. Hmm. And then what will you do tomorrow that you may have never thought you could? Well, in the future, I would love to work um, doing TBI for a football team, college, or pro. I think that's something that I would love to explore because, I, like I said, I have a, a sports medicine background and I would love to be able to tie my love of sports and my love of girl surgery with traumatic brain injury and spine and spinal cord injury in with sports that would like be my dream. Hmm. So maybe one day. All right. How can people learn more about you and your work? Well, I am working on my website. 
Um, I just said the so I don't have that up, but like they can always follow me on social media. A lot of people find me on my Instagram, and you know, and then I have a Facebook page as well. And I'm on Instagram at Great. Thank you so much, Doctor. I really appreciate you taking time out to connect with me here. You're an inspiration. I love keying in my daughters to what you've accomplished and making the world a better place. So thank you so much for everything you're doing. No problem. Thank you. All right. Bye now.